When the first European explorers began pushing into the interior of America nearly 500 years ago, they were astonished to find huge earthen enclosures and mound formations rivaling anything else constructed in the ancient world. These early explorers found hundreds of mound sites scattered throughout the eastern half of America. Eventually, about 200,000 mounds were located, but today, only a small fraction of those remain. Arguments about who built the mounds raged for hundreds of years, but today we know that the mounds were constructed by the ancestors of the present Native American tribes. While we know that ancient Native Americans built the mounds, a series of discoveries beginning in 1997 have raised several intriguing questions about the mound builders. When did the first people migrate to America? How many migrations were made? Where did these people come from? And how did they get here? Modern research into these questions is giving us an unexpected view of the ancient world. And perhaps the most unexpected finding of all is that nearly 70 years ago, the famous psychic Edgar Cayce related a history of the mound builders that almost perfectly matches what we now know. Join us as we explore the mysteries of the ancient American mound builders and look at how the 70-year-old statements made by Edgar Cayce appear to have predicted modern discoveries about ancient America. Many of the European settlers dug into the mounds as a popular pastime. The practice became even more prevalent as thousands of exquisite artifacts were uncovered. The mound builders left behind images of themselves on many of these artifacts. They show us a picture of a complex and advanced culture, but one that was deeply spiritual. The mounds reflect the deep spirituality of these ancient people in a simpler manner of constructing pyramids. Some of the mounds, especially the rounded cone-shaped ones, were erected as burial sites for elite members of society. An unexplained aspect of some of these rounded mounds is the presence of circular moats like the one shown here. Some of these sites have multiple rings of raised land and several moats, a characteristic that completely defies conventional explanations. In the latter stages of mound building, huge, flat-topped earthen pyramids were erected. Some of these reached the height of a modern 10-story building and 
were usually part of complexes containing up to a hundred mounds. These complexes served as central cities and were focal points of social and religious ceremonies. The least understood mounds are the gigantic earthworks that often enclose dozens of mounds of varying shapes as well as connecting different sites tens of miles away. Throughout all of Eastern America, but centering in Ohio, complex geometric earthworks enclosing a giant cone and pyramid-shaped mounds were constructed beginning in about 1000 BC. The size of many of these earthworks is so immense and the shapes are so intricate that many Americans often don't believe they still exist. The earthworks were long earthen walls formed from embankments as high as 33 feet tall. The walls of the embankments formed circles, octagons, and squares. These interconnected complexes often spread over many miles. In Ohio alone, it's believed that over 1,500 of these geometric enclosures once existed. The best preserved of these is in Newark, Ohio. Nearly 2,500 years ago in Newark, a 20-acre circle was formed by 12-foot high walls of earth. The circle was connected to a 50-acre octagon. Sacred pathways enclosed by parallel walls connected the Newark circle and octagon to other square and circular enclosures over two miles away. The Newark Circle and Octagon is maintained as a golf course and historic site where it still fascinates visitors. Its purpose is only partly known, but what is known is that it served to accurately chart the movements of the moon, enabling the builders to predict eclipses and other celestial events. In recent years, archaeologists have found evidence that a 56-mile road existed in ancient times connecting the Newark Circle and Octagon to a nearly identical formation in Chillicothe. The road was nearly 180 feet wide and was enclosed by earthen walls running the entire 56-mile length of the road. In what is today Portsmouth, Ohio, one of the most curious ancient complexes spread from the Portsmouth side of the Ohio River across into Kentucky following 14 miles of wide walkways enclosed by walls. The walkways connected a main site in Portsmouth to a complex series of circular moats enclosing a large central mound on the Kentucky side and also to a 15-acre square formation several miles away. The main complex in Portsmouth had several horseshoe-shaped embankments. Today, only one of the eight-foot-tall horseshoes remains in Portsmouth, but the huge square in Kentucky remains partly intact on private land. Sadly, the circular works in Kentucky have been totally destroyed. Yet there were other circular earthworks in Ohio quite similar to the Portsmouth groups. Some early towns like Circleville, Ohio, even built their first town centers to take advantage of the land rings. Not long after the enormous geometric earthen embankments were discovered, settlers found what appeared to be forts erected atop steep hills. The forts were usually constructed by making an outer embankment of earth 10 to 30 feet tall along the rim of the hilltop. Recent archaeological evidence shows that in some of these forts, wooden posts were embedded into the earthen wall, making the forts more defensible. Stone burial mounds are often found with it.
Other enigmatic shapes were formed from Earth by these mysterious builders. Ovals, semicircles, and even what appears to be a huge menorah surrounded by an oil lamp was found. The people who built many of these structures are collectively called the Adena and Hopewell cultures, but we actually know little about their practices. A later culture, known as the Mississippians, focused their mound building on the construction of large pyramid-shaped mounds where temples were erected on the flat top of the mound. As explorers and settlers pushed to the north and south, effigy mounds were found. It's estimated that 10,000 effigy mounds once existed in Iowa alone, but by the 1970s less than 1,500 remained. The most famous effigy mound in the world is Serpent Mound, located in southern Ohio. This quarter mile long effigy depicts an uncoiling snake and was built atop one of the strongest magnetic anomalies on the surface of the earth. The purposes of these effigy mounds are largely unexplained, but several Native American tribes, especially the Hopis, believe their ancestors erected them during ancient migrations across America. The legends of the Hopi were first translated and published 18 years after Edgar Cayce's death. The Hopis tell of a series of four creations in the world, followed by near-complete destructions. Amazingly, it's a legend that is almost identical to the story of the ancient world as told by Edgar Cayce, and some of the rituals of the Hopi reenact these legends. most ways, but at an early age he began showing unusual abilities. Author John Van Auken tells how his family discovered one of his unique traits. And one night his father was testing him on his spelling and he didn't know any of the words. And his father became very upset with him and said, listen, dude, we've got to do something here. This has got to change. And the little boy said, how about letting me sleep on the book for about 15 minutes and then you come back and ask me those questions. So the little boy put the book, the spelling book, behind his head and for about 15 minutes he took a little nap on that book. And then his father came in, woke him, took the book and asked him the words and he knew every one of them. Not only did he know the words on that page, he had told his dad he knew the words on every page in the book and exactly what page they were on. It was as though somehow he had gotten a photographic image of that book in his mind and he knew each page and the letters on those pages. That was the beginning of the hint that there was something about this boy that eventually led him to be called the Sleeping Prophet many years later in a famous book come out, a, a biography on him called The Sleeping Prophet. In 1895, Edgar met 15-year-old Gertrude Evans in Hopkinsville, and in 1897 he proposed marriage. By the time they married in 1903, Edgar Cayce's remarkable ability had already been well publicized. 
The Caseys moved several times during the ensuing years, and Edgar made his living as an accomplished photographer. He was a family man and raised two sons, Hugh Lynn and Edgar Evans. The story of how Casey became involved in health readings began with Casey's own health affliction. Much later in his life, uh, he lost his voice, and the doctors couldn't determine anything physically wrong with him, so they were really stumped and there was not much they could do. So Edgar Casey asked a local hypnotist if he'd hypnotize him, and while under the hypnotic state, if he'd ask him what would help fix the voice. Now, the peculiar part is here, he can't speak, so why would you even ask him that? <laughs> Nevertheless, the hypnotist went along with it, and under hypnosis, he spoke clearly. And he told the hypnotist exactly what to tell Casey's body to do, which was to concentrate all the blood into the throat until the hypnotist saw his throat become blood red, and then tell him to rebalance the circulation of the body for normal functioning. The hypnotist did all of this, and when Casey awoke, he spoke perfectly, and everything was fine. On a couple of occasions, some local doctors had particularly difficult medical situations, and so they thought they'd just try this young sleeping seer out. And they went to Casey, and he did this self-hypnosis on himself, went inside. They told him who the patient was, where the patient lived, and it was as though somehow his mind could connect with him. He could give a complete diagnosis of the individual, no matter where they were physically, and recommend a course of action that would help. He got so good at it that the doctors collected a lot of these stories, and eventually they got published um, in major newspapers and magazines, and he became quite well known as a sort of psychic diagnostician. Because so many people were helped by the advice given during the readings, the request for help began consuming a large part of Casey's life and placed undress on his family. In 1923, Casey hired Gladys Davis, shown here on the right, as the stenographer for the readings. Gladys remained devoted to documenting and preserving the Casey readings until her death in 1986. By the time he died in 1945, Casey had left over 14,000 documented readings compiled on nearly 50,000 pages. About two-thirds of these readings were for health issues. They're housed at the Virginia Beach-based Association for Research and Enlightenment. Edgar Casey's grandson, Dr. Charles Thomas Casey, serves as executive director of the organization. I like to define the ARE really by the three words in the name, Association, Research, and Enlightenment. Association, to me, refers to a, a group of people, which with the ARE is people who have some of the same interests and questions about some unusual topics, some very common topics, but it's a group of people with similar interests. The research part of the name is um, a commitment, I think, implied in the Edgar Casey readings to not simply present this material that came through this unusual man as dogma or as fact, but look at it as hypotheses to be tested. Casey is often considered to be the father of the holistic health movement. The accuracy of his health readings is considered very high. David McMillan, director of the Meridian Institute, has authored several books looking at Casey's health ideas. The holistic movement and I think probably the alternative medicine movement in America owes Edgar Casey a great deal. It's never been documented just because the people that came out of the holistic movement uh, and various other practitioners that were familiar with Casey were some of the leading influences in alternative medicine. The strength of the Casey approach when you, when you look at research is that you look at what we know in modern medical research and you look at whatever Casey was saying and the more you know, the better Casey looks. In the early 1920s, Casey began giving another type of psychic reading, one that produced a fantastic history of the world. Casey's history of the ancient world actually emerges in bits and pieces um, 
found in several of the different life readings from various souls who had activity in Mu, uh, Maya, or Atlantis, or Egypt. Um, and you would have to go into those various life readings and get little bits and pieces. But eventually there was enough uh, information there that it caused a lot of people to want to really get right focused on Atlantis or Egypt. And so they began a series of readings specifically on that topic. Edgar Casey's youngest son, Edgar Evans Casey, is an engineer by profession. In the 1960s, Edgar Evans began compiling the Casey readings on Atlantis in an effort to determine whether they were valid. His two subsequent books on the topic have both been bestsellers. When I first started writing the book, I didn't know because I didn't, hadn't read all the readings yet. And at that time, I didn't care. I wanted to know whether it was right or whether it was wrong. The more you get into it and the more time that goes on, all the newer discoveries continue to substantiate what he said. Casey gave 68 psychic readings that contained information on ancient America and mound builders. Our 2001 book, Mound Builders, evaluated Casey's 68 readings on ancient America. While academic archaeology has never studied Casey's mound builder readings, a major problem was where he said the mound builder culture originated, as well as the dates he gave. Mound builders came up from the south, according to him, and that they were descendants of some of the Atlanteans or some of the people that came over to uh, Central and South America. Casey gave a lot of dates that upset a lot of people. No one today believes that Native Americans are a uniform race of people, but archaeologists have long told us that their ancestors came to America in a single migration away from Siberia, beginning in 9,500 BC. Prior to 1997, it was believed to be a fact that the very first humans in any of the Americas entered into Alaska across the land bridge formed by the lowered oceans caused by the last ice age. These nomadic hunters followed wandering herds of big game. Archaeologists call the culture of these people Clovis because of a distinct spear point found at their sites. Clovis points have never been found in Siberia. Nevertheless, for the past 70 years, the date 9500 BC has been called the Clovis First Barrier, signifying them as the first Americans. In early 1997, a panel of archaeologists announced that indisputable evidence showed that the excavation site at Monte Verde in southern Chile had been occupied a thousand years before the Clovis Barrier. Perhaps as an omen of things to come, on the very day the panel of archaeologists made their announcement, a deeper level of artifacts was uncovered at Monte Verde. This layer pointed to someone living at the site 33 to 37,000 years ago. Over the next few years, archaeologists returned to other sites and dug below the Clovis level where their previous digs had stopped. In Brazil, the site dated to 38,000 BC. In Pennsylvania, a rock shelter showed human occupation in 24,000 BC. A Virginia site dated to 17,000 BC. Soon, a host of other sites in the Americas showed pre-Clovis occupation and the Clovis barrier collapsed. Casey's story of the mound builders involved several groups. Prior to 50,000 BC, America was already occupied by people practicing a primitive but highly spiritual culture. According to Casey, they lived predominantly in the southwest and left behind carvings and paintings and caves. Some of these people had come from a sinking continent called Mu in the South Pacific. In many readings, Casey describes these people as being much like an early Stone Age culture. 
Casey also stated that the American continents were overrun by herds of huge animals, a fact that was confirmed by archaeologists sometime after Casey made this rather startling statement. The most important part of Casey's story of the mound builder centers on the years 10,000 BC and 3000 BC. According to Casey, just before 10,000 BC, Atlanteans fled their last remaining islands prior to their final destruction. Most of these people went to the northeast of America and east across the Atlantic Ocean, but a small group went to Yucatan to establish a hall of records. The location of this site is believed to be at Piedras Negras in Guatemala. The 2000 book, The Lost Hall of Records, explains that an identical hall of records was placed in both Egypt and Yucatan to preserve the history and knowledge of Atlantis. According to Casey, in 3000 BC, a mysterious group of people he called remnants of lost tribes came by boat to the southernmost portion of America where they remained for a relatively brief time. Surprisingly, the settlement of these people may have been found. In 1997, a startling discovery was made at Watson Break near Monroe, Louisiana. Over 200 carbon dating tests were conducted on a strange 22-acre circular mound formation found there some years earlier. The results of the carbon dating showed that Watson Break was the first mound site in America, dating to between 3400 and 3000 BC. Where these people came from is unknown, and they left for parts unknown less than 180 years later. They fished and traded with people already in the area, and were definitely advanced in the use of boats. The time frame of Watson Break perfectly matches Casey's chronology. According to Casey, after arriving in the southernmost part of America in 3000 BC, the descendants of the Lost Tribes moved to the area around Mexico City where they merged with the pyramid building cultures already in the area. However, the practice of human sacrifice gradually emerged in this culture. The descendants of the Lost Tribes and the descendants of the Atlanteans in the Yucatan joined together to escape the increasingly dangerous rituals in Central America. This merged group fled the human sacrifice practices and went back to the southernmost area of America, to where the Lost Tribes had landed in 3000 BC. There they began the practice of mound building. It was intended to be a simpler and more spiritual way of life. In the 1950s, archaeologists discovered a site that could be the location where the group of Atlanteans and Lost Tribes fled to from the Yucatan. This massive complex of earthworks and mounds is at Poverty Point, Louisiana, only 40 miles from Watson Break. Much of it still exists today. This incredible site was home to at least 10,000 people who lived atop a series of high earthen embankments arranged into a semi-octagon. The site focused on a massive bird effigy mound that was 70 feet tall and 650 feet by 700 feet in extent. The amount of earth contained in the embankments at Poverty Point would fill the Great Pyramid at Giza 30 times. Construction at Poverty Point probably began in 2000 BC, reaching its peak by 1500 BC. From there, many archaeologists believe small groups migrated north up the Mississippi River, eventually taking the mound builder culture into the Ohio River Valley. Decades before Poverty Point was discovered, Casey had stated that the merged group of Atlanteans and Lost Tribes had gradually moved up the Mississippi River into Ohio, where they began the mound building culture found there. It's assumed that Casey's term Lost Tribes referred to a pre-Semitic people dispersing from the Middle East sometime after the fall of the Tower of Babel. Interestingly, the Watson Break site is formed much like a prehistoric Semitic encampment. Archaeologists have also found nearly 700 small earthen blocks at Watson Break. They bear an uncanny resemblance to Payam blocks, small Semitic counterweights used in trading. Other evidence of a pre-Hebrew influence on mound building exists. The East Fork Works, which were once near Milford, Ohio, were constructed in the shape of a menorah, and the outline of an oil lamp appears to surround it. Because of its shape, archaeologists have strongly asserted that it never existed. But in 1996, a University of Ohio professor found the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers survey of the site in the National Archives. 
The site was surveyed by a team of engineers in 1823 because of the interest in it by former President Thomas Jefferson. Other evidence suggesting a Middle Eastern influence is the existence of many altars and many mounds. These are seldom discussed by archaeologists because many of the altars have been found covered by the ashes of animal sacrifices. In addition, several engraved tablets have turned up in mounds bearing Paleo-Hebrew script. This one, found in 1889 by the Smithsonian, is believed to be a genuine pre-Hebrew tablet. Finally, Central America has yielded many artifacts suggesting a Hebrew influence, including this sun disk bearing the Star of David. So much evidence has been found over the years that the conclusion is inescapable. Ancient America received visitors from the Middle East, and mound building began in southernmost America in 3000 BC, just as Casey stated. These people disappeared for a thousand years and seemed to have returned to their original location, bringing with them an enhanced form of mound building. From there, they migrated north into Ohio. From the late 1980s to the present, a new form of genetic testing has been performed on living Native Americans to identify the origin of their ancestors. The same testing has been applied to ancient remains recovered from America's mounds and grave sites. This type of testing allows geneticists to not only identify where the ancestors of the tested person came from, but when they probably migrated to America. Five primary types of mitochondrial DNA have been identified in ancient and living Native Americans. While some archaeologists disagree, the results of these tests strongly suggest three waves of migrations into America, exactly as Casey told us over 70 years ago. The first occurred between 47,000 to 38,000 BC from Siberian Asia, nearly matching Casey's 50,000 BC migration from the West. The second migration occurred in 28,000 BC from China, Asia, and the South Pacific. Incredibly, the date and locations of this migration exactly match Casey. According to geneticists, the final wave of migration occurred in 10,000 BC, the same date Casey gave. At first, geneticists and archaeologists believed that all of the Native Americans' ancestors had come from some part of Asia, but that idea has now been discounted several groups of people had come to ancient America from the South Pacific, and one other nagging problem appeared. One of the types of mitochondrial DNA was not Asian in origin. One of the biggest flaws in attempting to place the origin of mitochondrial DNA is that scientists only consider locations that still exist today. If a migration actually came from a place that no longer exists, Scientists would automatically place its origin in Africa or Asia, since they believe this is where all humanity originated. Casey stated that the sunken islands of Atlantis had supplied some of the ancient people who migrated to America. The idea of Atlantis produces strong ridicule in most American archaeologists, but archaeologists in other parts of the world usually take it seriously. Atlantis has been placed virtually everywhere in the world by speculative writers, but Plato and other ancient historians said that it was in the Atlantic Ocean. So much has been written about Atlantis that it's sometimes difficult to sort out what Casey actually said about it. Casey placed Atlantis close to the Caribbean Ocean. Recent discoveries of underwater ruins in the area may eventually reveal Casey's Atlantis, but genetics may prove to be the strongest evidence. About 4% of Native Americans have mitochondrial DNA that is classified as haplogroup X, one of the mitochondrial DNA types that did not originate in Asia. Haplogroup X has been found in ancient Iroquois remains and in all of the other places in America where Casey stated Atlanteans migrated. Incredibly, recent testing has shown the presence of haplogroup X in every location of the world where Casey indicated groups of Atlanteans went before their island sunk. 
These areas include the Pyrenees Mountains, the Middle East, and even in the Gobi Desert. The actual origin of Haplogroup X is not known, but its presence in all of the places where Casey stated the Atlanteans migrated is certainly compelling. Haplogroup X may well be Atlantean DNA, spread to various parts of the world by several migrations. The migrations from Atlantis took place in stages that were caused by a long-term breakup of the island. Around uh, 200,000 BC, Atlantis began to emerge in the Atlantic. The Earth went through many changes, physical changes, earthquakes, violent eruptions and changes in volcanic activity caused these major continents of Mu and Atlantis to break up into islands, and even those islands eventually broke up. This caused a great migration of those who survived all of that violent time in the Earth. Uh, and they mostly migrated to the lands we're familiar with today. Archaeologists often argue that Atlantis was said to have advanced technology, but since the people migrating to America in 10,000 BC did not have technology as we think of it today, they reason that Atlantis never existed. The answer to this issue may be in the Casey readings. According to Casey, in both 50,000 BC and 28,000 BC, Atlantis experienced a series of violent eruptions. The events broke Atlantis into islands and devastated the high technology of the culture. Casey placed the peak of Atlantis's technology before 28,000 BC, and by its final sinking in 10,014 BC, it appears that the Atlantis survivors had not yet recovered their prior glory. He mentions the highest civilization in Atlantis being in that period around 28,000. He mentions, in fact, he mentions three destructions of Atlantis, not one. He mentioned one to about 50,000, and one about 28,000, and uh, one around 10,000, which is the one Plato, I think, talked about. The second one was when it was split into islands, and it, a lot of people were lost their lives or went east and west at that time. And so probably the civilization was, they lost a lot of their factories, or a lot of their equipment, a lot of everything. And, I'm sure that the, there was a downturn in civilization from that time to 10,000 BC. Interestingly, archaeologists have always asserted that an advanced culture did enter America in 10,000 BC. They termed these people Clovis and have always thought that they came from Siberia. But since Clovis artifacts have never been found in Siberia, it's necessary to look elsewhere for their origin. Clovis artifacts have been found in the area of Europe where Casey said Atlanteans went even before the 10,000 BC destruction. These same areas are the ones where Haplogroup X is found. The evidence is certainly suggestive. The Clovis culture in America and the similar culture in Europe may have been carried to each place by survivors of a now lost civilization that was located between these two continents. Both the Aztecs and Mayas of Central America have legends relating that their ancestors migrated from a violently erupting island in the east. They called this island Aztalan, and numerous Aztec codices like the Codex Botarini depict scenes from this migration. Many Atlantis proponents believe that Aztalan was Atlantis. In about 350 BC, the philosopher Plato gave a detailed description of the main city of Atlantis. A temple was erected on a high hill or mound around which a ring of water was formed. A total of three water rings were eventually made and interspersed with two land rings. A main canal was then dug to the ocean. High bridges were then constructed in a cross-like pattern from the outer land to the central temple hill. The total diameter of this city was only two miles, and it contained the bulk of the Atlantean technology. The image of this series of circles in a central cross pattern has been found on many Native American artifacts. It was a sacred symbol to many tribes, and it's been interpreted as a sun worship image by archaeologists, but it may actually symbolize Atlantis. Casey stated that some mounds were constructed to symbolize Atlantis and perhaps the best evidence of an Atlantis influence on mound building 
was at ancient Portsmouth, Ohio. On the Kentucky side of the river, the series of moats and raised land around the central mound appear to depict Atlantis with astonishing accuracy. The wide road leading to the Ohio River may represent the canal to the ocean. The site could have been used for ritualistic reenactments of their descendants' migration from their sinking homeland. I can understand how, uh, you know, an academic community wouldn't like to say they had taken information from a psyche, but uh, I believe information from a psyche, but I, I, I think that, uh, I think they'll make discoveries that will confirm more of what he said in the future, just like it has happened in the past. The best research that is out there, when you look at it closely, it, it really makes Edgar Casey look very good. For over 20 years, I've been haunted by Native American mounds. The more mounds I visited and the more I studied the vast literature on this amazing culture, the more I began to suspect that something was terribly wrong with the history we were being told. Textbooks told us with near certainty that America was unpopulated prior to 9500 BC. Evidence that suggested migrations earlier than 10,000 BC was ridiculed and sometimes even hidden by archaeologists, and even the legends of the Native Americans themselves were rudely dismissed as inaccurate. The near-complete shift that took place in American archaeology in 1997 led me to take a closer look at the ideas Edgar Casey brought forth over 70 years ago. Casey told us that there were three waves of migrations to ancient America. He told us where these people came from and even when they came. He told us that mound building was first established in southern America and that these people then came north. He also told us that they practiced forms of worship utilizing sacrificial altars and that they had built some mounds to represent Atlantis. All of these ideas had been considered as ridiculous to archaeologists, but now every one of them seems to be the genuine history of ancient America. It's rather amazing to find that this incredible history about ancient America, a history related by a psychic who devoted his life to helping others, appears to be accurate. For Native Americans, and many others like myself who are part Native American, these developments can be viewed in different ways. Some believe that the new evidence is an attempt to rewrite history and may be a way of robbing Native Americans of their heritage. But for many of us, we prefer to see this as a profound enrichment of ourselves. The origins and beliefs of the peoples of ancient America are far more mysterious than we ever thought. Casey placed the ancestors of current Native American tribes in America long, long ago. They were a literal melding pot of the oldest people on earth and some of the most advanced cultures. Perhaps one day we will find the great central city of Atlantis, and perhaps we'll also find the Hall of Records that Casey said was buried in several locations. Until that time, it may be wise to consider the central theme of Casey's overall message. there is embedded in the Edgar Casey material a premise that there's more to us than a physical body, that more than the physical body is referred to in the Casey readings as our spiritual nature. Over 500 years ago when Columbus first set foot in this hemisphere, it's believed that over 56 million people already lived in the Americas. Within a few generations, the population fell by 90% as war and European diseases decimated entire tribes and cities. Their land was taken from them, and virtually every treaty made with them was broken. Despite this monumental tragedy, a deep spirituality remains in modern tribes, and the true spirit of Native America lives on in ways the ancient ones never imagined. And today, the face of Native America is more diverse than ever and many of us share Native American bloodlines and also share a deep interest in practicing a simpler form of spirituality. Yeah!